Hello, and welcome to the Brinks 2017 IP Developments Webinar. My name is Bailey Reeves, and I will be in the background answering any Adobe Connect technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties within the Adobe Connect session, please use the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen, and our technical assistance team will help in any way possible. If you are having issues hearing over the phone, you may press star zero and an operator will assist you. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, to maintain privacy, the number and name of attendees will not be displayed. All attendees will be in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation, and as a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. To submit a question, click on the Q&A panel located on the lower right side of your screen. Type your question into the text field and hit send. Please keep this send to default as all panelists. This seminar is accredited for one hour of Illinois MCLE credit. Please inquire if you wish to seek CLE accreditation in additional states. During the webinar, we will be providing three CLE codes. Please write these down. We will be emailing evaluation forms at the end of the webinar and we'll ask for the codes. If you have any questions regarding CLE, please contact CLE at BrinkSkelson.com. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our moderator for today, Jim Sobere. Jim, you now have the floor. Thank you, Bailey. Hello, everybody. My name is Jim Sobere. I'm the president of Brink Skilson and Leon. Uh, welcome, and I want to thank you for uh, dialing in and participating in our webinar today. Last year, in 2016, we saw a lot of changes in the field of, in of intellectual property, and we anticipate more changes on the way in 2017. In our 2017 Brinks IP forecast, we're going to talk about the impact of some of those important changes that occurred in 2016, and they're going to have effects in 2017 and also give you our, our thoughts on what further changes we see coming down the road in 2017. I'd also like to take a, a, a moment to, to let you know that this is the centennial year for Brinks Gilson and Leon. We actually started as a, a two-person firm in Chicago under the name of Wilkinson and Huxley back on January 1st of, of 1917. Over the years, we've expanded. We are now in, in seven offices. Our, our headquarters is still in Chicago. We also have offices in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Washington, D.C., Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, Tampa, Florida, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Salt Lake City. Over the 100 years, we've been proud to have a very strong culture of passion for intellectual property, client service, and teamwork. Today, we're one of the largest dedicated IP firms in the United States with over 135 uh, uh, IP attorneys, patent agents, and scientific advisors. And we always continue to be forward-looking. While we're proud of our past, we're really excited about the future. In fact, this year, we, will, we plan to open our first office outside the U.S. in Shenzhen, China. If you're not familiar with Shenzhen, it's known as the Silicon Valley of China. Uh, when uh, we have the official opening date, you can look forward to receiving an, an, uh, another announcement from us. Now I'd like to introduce the presenters for today's program. Our lead off uh, presenter will be Danielle Gillen, who's going to talk about patent prosecution looking back at 2016 and ahead in 2017. Uh, after Danielle, uh, Josh Frick will talk to us about some important developments regarding trademark prosecution. And then our final presenter will be Greg Hillier, who is in our DC office. And he's going to give us some insights on litigation and, and some recent changes affecting claim construction rulings, both in the district courts and in PTAB proceedings. Now, uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation today, you'll need to make notes of these CLE codes. The first CLE code to uh, jot down is called development. It's up on the screen now. So at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, Danielle Gillen. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Danielle Gillen. Uh, I'm an associate here at Brinks Gilson Leon Chicago. And I will be talking to you about uh, U.S. patent prosecution, uh, looking back at 2016 and ahead in 2017. Uh, 
I will talk briefly about the uh, Federal Circuit's 101 precedential decisions that issued in 2016. Uh, the Federal Circuit also recognized the patent agent privilege uh, this past year, and the USPTO's P3 program, uh, the proposed fee changes for 2017, uh, and the case studies uh, pilot program, uh, and the potential publication of that in 2017. Uh, starting with um, the ALICE 101 framework, which many uh, patent prosecutors are aware of here, um, I noted recently in the AMDOC decision that I will discuss that even though we have this ALICE framework uh, provided in the three bullet points, um, the court in AMDOC said a search for a single test or definition in the decided cases concerning 101 from this court and indeed from the Supreme Court reveals that at present there is no such single, succinct, usable definition or test, which is telling for the cases and, and handling these thus far. Uh, this table provides uh, the five Federal Circuit uh, Presidential 101 decisions from 2016 that found eligibility. Um, I will be discussing the first four decisions uh, that ad address software. Starting with the uh, BASCOM and AMDOC decision, these two decisions, uh, the Federal Circuit did find that the claims were directed to an abstract idea, uh, but they contained an inventive concept that amounted to more than the abstract idea. So in BASCOM, the subject matter was directed to a content filtering system for filtering content on uh, the Internet. Uh, the court talked about the prior art types of filtering systems. One was on specific to a local computer. Uh, the other prior art relocated the filtering to a local server, but it was a one-size-fits-all type of filter, which was not ideal um, for multiple end users using a single type of filtering criteria. So the inventive concept based on the uh, claim was an ordered combination including the installation of a filtering tool at a specific location, remote from the end users, with customizable filtering features specific to each end user. Uh, this was an improvement over the prior art because the benefits of a filter on a local computer and on the internet service provider server, um, so end users could customize um, how their uh, internet um, content was filtered. The court noted that an inventive concept may be found with non-conventional and non-generic arrangement of known conventional pieces. Um, the court also addressed preemption in its 101 analysis and that the claimed invention did not preempt all ways of filtering content on the Internet. Judge Newman also had a concurrence uh, in this case, but it was more to note the cumbersome procedures that have come to play now with these separate determinations of patent eligibility and patent ability um, and urging a more flexible approach. In the AMDOC decision, which was the most recent uh, Federal Circuit Presidential decision on 101, uh, similar to BOSCOM, the court did find that the claim was directed to an abstract idea, uh, but found um, it had an inventive concept over that abstract idea. The subject matter in the case dealt with parts of a system designed to solve an accounting and billing problem uh, faced by network service providers. Uh, the prior art uh, involved you could store information in one location, which made it difficult to keep up with massive record flows from the network devices and which required huge databases. So the improvement over the prior art that the court recognized was it required Yes, generic gatherers, generic network devices, and other components, but they worked in an unconventional distributed fashion to solve this problem of massive record flows uh, that previously required uh, large databases. Um, one thing to note in this decision was uh, in finding the claims um, patent eligible, um, the court reviewed the claims at issue against claims of other Federal Circuit 101 decisions to determine whether or not they were aligned with, um, more aligned with one decision versus the other. Um, this came up in Judge Reyna's dissent in this case. Uh, she took issue with this comparison of the asserted claims to the claims at issue in, 
some but not all of the Federal Circuit's post-Alice decisions. Um, the court in this case also addressed preemption uh, and said that the claim did not preempt any and all generic enhancement of data in a similar system. Uh, the next two cases are the ENFISH and MICRO decisions. These are slightly different than the previous two decisions in the sense that the Federal Circuit actually found that the claims starting with step one were not even directed to an abstract um, idea. So in ENFISH, uh, the prior art once again was directed to this relational model uh, that information was stored in separate tables. So you can imagine an Excel file, you have document level information in one table, creator person information uh, in one table, and company level information in a separate table. The claimed invention was uh, included this self-referential model um, that you could store all entity types in a single table uh, and define the table's columns by rows in the same table. Uh, while the self-referential model terms don't appear in this representative claim, what appears in the claim is means for configuring, and the district court determined that this means for configuring required a four-step algorithm including this self-referential model or table. So the improvement over the prior art was this faster searching of data, effective storage of data other than structured text, and flexibility in database configuration. So the legal inquiry really was whether the claims are directed to an improvement to computer functionality rather than uh, directed to um, an abstract idea. Um, in the MICRO decision, like I had mentioned, the court also found here that the claims were not even directed to an abstract idea. Um, the prior art in this case dealt with the animation of character and lip synchronization was done by a, a person, an animator, with the assistance of a computer. Uh, this was time consuming and tedious, and the claim subject matter was directed to automating a 3D animator's task through uh, specific rules. So the improvement over the prior art was allowing computers to produce accurate and realistic lip synchronization and facial, facial expressions um, that could not be produced by human animators. So that this was more of a rapid, efficient uh, manipulation of character facial expressions that also uh, decreased cost. Uh, here, the uh, court also focused on whether the claims um, had an improvement uh, on the relevant technology. Uh, the Federal Circuit, the next two slides uh, show 11 different uh, presidential Federal Circuit cases finding the claims ineligible. Here, I won't go into detail on these in, in view of timing. Um, but I thought that the next slide was interesting. This is from BilskyBlog.com. It shows you each Federal Circuit judge um, and whether or not they've had patent eligible um, and ineligible decisions. Uh, you'll see here that Judge Stoll, uh, Judge Newman, Judge Chen, Judge Toronto, and Judge Moore um, have each have had two cases finding the claims patent eligible. And Judge Newman and Judge Moore in particular have had a narrow number of finding ineligible cases as compared to um, finding the two eligible cases. Uh, the USPTO also this past year has put out several different memos um, to help examiners um, and also practitioners uh, understand the evolving uh, 101 mat subject matter. Uh, in May, um, there were two uh, memos. One was to help examiners formulate uh, 101 rejections uh, and to evaluate the uh, applicant's response and also uh, subject matter eligibility updates on NFISH and the TLI communications decisions. More recently, um, the USPTO in November issued a memo with, um, based on the MICRO and BASCOM decisions. Um, they had some recommendations to examiners which included that under step one of the ALICE framework, you should, uh, examiners should not overgeneralize the claim or simplify it into a gist or core principles, which um, many practitioners were often facing with examiners. 
Uh, in step 2B, um, also the guidance said that examiners should consider the additional elements in combination as well as individually when determining whether a claim as a whole amounts to significantly more. Uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, four precedential cases finding eligibility by the Federal Circuit address preemption, um, and the PTO noticed that um, and it encouraged examiners to continue using the Mayo-Alice framework, uh, specifically steps 2A and 2B, to resolve questions of preemption. Um, in view of these five precedential decisions, uh, the USPTO also um, informed examiners to re rely on precedential decisions in their rejections rather than non-precedential decisions. Um, the PTO also uh, issued um, some business method examples uh, in December of 2016 for reference. Um, in view of the um, the decisions, some recommendations uh, for 101 prosecution is it is heavily examiner dependent. Um, so you can you can really get more um, movement if you get on the phone with the examiner multiple times. Um, and for older applications that your spec might not contain certain information, you may consider submitting a non-inventor affidavit or declaration showing how the claimed invention improves the function or efficiency of the computer. Um, and when drafting new patent applications uh, directed to software or potentially other areas where 101 will come into play, you may want to draft your specification a problem solution benefit format. This was emphasized by the court in addressing 101. What is the improvement over the prior art? Uh, this is a similar to European EPO practice where um, there's a problem solution approach to assess inventive step. Um, you can also draft the claims with knowledge of district court and federal circuit cases that actually find the claims patent eligible. Um, this is similar to what even the Federal Circuit did in the Amdocs decision. They look specifically at claims of their previous decisions uh, to find the claims in Amdocs uh, patent eligible. Uh, the Federal Circuit and In Ray Queens uh, also recognize the patent agent privilege um, this year which applies to uh, a patentee's communications with a non-attorney patent agent regarding uh, prosecution of the patents. Um, there is a limitation on the privilege. It is limited to communications that are within the scope of activities authorized by Congress, which is under 37 CFR 11.5 B1. Um, this includes a, a, a list of different types of activities, including preparing and prosecuting um, patent applications, drafting an amendment or apply, uh, et cetera. It does not, though, apply to communications regarding the validity of a patent in anticipation of litigation, the sale or purchase of a patent, or uh, infringement. Uh, the USPTO um, in 2016 also rolled out the P3 program. This was an option for uh, when facing a final rejection. Um, there was an additional option compared to the after final consideration pilot program and the pre-appeal program. Um, it just recently ended. Um, the limit of 1,600 requests, I believe, is met for each tech center except for tech center 1,600. Um, the benefits of this program was uh, you received a notice of decision with a brief written summary. You were able to give a 20-minute presentation before the panel of examiners, including the SPEE, the examiner record, and a primary. And there were no fees associated with it. Um, the PTO, I believe, has yet to issue official uh, communication on whether or not the program will be renewed, um, but based on previous uh, pilot programs, um, we hope that this one will be renewed as well. Um, back in October, uh, the USPTO issued a notice of proposed rulemaking for proposed fee changes. Um, we it anticipate the final rule by the end of this upcoming fiscal year. Um, and the last major fee increase was in March of 2013. Um, 
There's 205 proposed fee adjustments. You can see here, here are some ones for utility, patents. Uh, these are all for large entity. For IDS, notice of appeal and RCE. There, these do offer an increase, but they um, are marginal compared to some of um, the other ones with respect to design patents and the PTAB proceedings. For design patents, the exam fee is up $140. Your issuance fee is up $240. And at the PTAB, IPR request fees for up to 20 claims are up $5,000. Uh, and post-grant or CBM request fees up to 20 claims is up to $4,000. Um, back at the end of 2015, beginning into 2016, the USPTO started a case studies pilot, um, and it was narrowed down into six topics. Um, these six topics, the first three um, involved 101 decisions, um, and the last three involved 103 and 112 um, issues as well. And um, I believe this was supposed, a part of it was supposed to be published already in 2016, but it has yet to be. Um, and they were anticipating that um, the publication will happen in the first quarter of 2017. Um, the, these case studies are to be able to identify quality issues, uh, as well as examples of uh, best practices for examination uh, to improve patent work product. Um, and to reveal areas where further training for examiners uh, in the PTO may be needed. And uh, the next CLE code uh, is ahead, and my colleague Josh Frick will now take over. Thank you. Hi, I'm Josh Frick. I'm a shareholder here at Brinks, and today I will highlight trademark prosecution and litigation developments and tips for 2017. Uh, there are several important new developments and relevant trademark it, relevant to trademark prosecution in the PTO, as well as the op, as well as the opposition and cancellation proceedings in front of the trademark trial and appeal board that will affect the way we practice in two, 2017 and beyond. As for trademark litigation, I want to discuss two cases that will raise that have already raised important questions in trademark practice, one of which was argued before the Supreme Court just last week. First, um, I'd like to discuss developments relevant to trademark prosecution. First development I want to highlight is that on January 14, 2017, the PTO implemented several changes to trademark fees. Uh, most of the fees were increased most of the changes were increases in fees, but there were several, or a few that actually went down. Uh, the, the purpose of these changes was to promote the efficiency of the filing process, mostly by encouraging electronic filings, which are, are being encouraged with lower fees. It was also intended to better align the fees with the cost of products and services and to protect the integrity of the register by incentivizing timely filings and the PTO's examination of those filings. On this slide, there's a summary of some of the newly implemented fees. Uh, note the substantially higher fees for paper filings, which is in line with the PTO initiative to encourage electronic filings. Uh, also included on the, the chart here, in addition to just the, the prosecution fees, the fees for uh, filing a petition to cancel and a notice of opposition were raised $100 each. Another newly implemented change in trademark prosecution is a reformatted declaration used for electronic filings. Uh, starting in January, on January 14, 2017, applicants and registrants who are electronically signing a declaration or affidavit saw a newly formatted declaration. Uh, the revised declaration separa separates out each clause of the declaration and requires the users to check a box next to each clause. And these, these new declarations apply to declarations signed for applications for registration, allegations of use, and post-registration declarations uh, for continued use and excusable non-use. And to, to better show you how these changes appear to applicants, uh, on this slide, there, this is how the declaration used to appear. It was just one big, long paragraph that made it hard for someone signing this to make sense of what they were actually signing. Uh, and then after January 14th, uh, applicants and registrants see this newly reformatted declaration where each clause of the declaration is separated out into separate lines. And before the, the 
person signing the declaration can actually insert their name electronically, they have to put a checkbox next to each, each line here. Uh, the change may, may appear to be straightforward, but uh, since January 14th, I've already received several questions from clients who are used to seeing the old format, and they, this is a little offsetting to them. It's a little confusing when they see it the first time and they have questions about it. So it's good to, to see it before you sign in. Next is uh, I'd like to discuss the PTO's Proof of Use pilot program, which led to a significant change that will be implemented in February. Uh, this program was a two-year program the PTO uh, used to assess and promote the accuracy and integrity of the trademark register. Uh, the PTO randomly selected 500 registrations for which declarations of use were due to determine the actual use of the marks in connection with the goods and services identified in the registration. Uh, in addition to the one specimen per class that is required to, uh, to maintain a registration, the PTO required that these registrants submit proof of use of the mark in, in addition to just that one specimen. So they, they may have required um, proof of use on several different, several different goods or services within a class, which isn't normally required. And of the 500 regist registrations that were uh, at, at involved in the program, owners of 51% of the selected registrations failed to supply proof of use of the specific goods and services. And this resulted in either those goods and services being deleted from the registration or the registration being canceled entirely. Uh, as a result of the pilot program, the PTO concluded that there was a need for an ongoing effort aimed at ensuring the accuracy and integrity of the trademark register as to the actual use of marks in connection with, in connection with the goods and services identified in the registration. Uh, and this led to a change that will take effect on February 17th. Uh, starting in February, the, the PTO may require such information, exhibits, affidavits, or declarations, and additional specimens of use that may be reasonably necessary for the PTO to assess and promote the accuracy and integrity of the register. Uh, similar to what happened in the pilot program, the PTO now may, may require that applicants and registrants submit more than one specimen per class of goods or services currently required. Uh, this will be especially important for applications and registrations that include a long list of goods and services because I'm, I'm guessing that that will be a flag for the PTO to examine those reg applications and registrations more closely. Uh, and this will also be important for registrations that were initially based on a foreign registration where the registrant was not required to show use of the mark prior to registration. Uh, it will be interesting to see how the PTO enforces the new policy, but it will be important for applicants and registrants to be prepared to provide proof of use in connection with all of the goods and services identified in an application or registration just in case the PTO requests uh, additional specimens. Now I just want to briefly highlight a few new resources available on the PTO website that are helpful to stay current with PTO developments. Uh, the first is the MyUSPTO website which allows users to um, create a personalized collection of widgets and links to receive news and information about status changes from the PTO. It also allows users to build a docket to track up to 20 applications and registrations. Uh, this is useful for individuals, which is how the, the website is currently set up, but eventually the PTO would like to evolve this into a more robust website and allow organi organizations to use it to share information between, between colleagues. Uh, the next resource is one that I found to be uh, pretty useful is the trademark alerts uh, page. You can sign up by submitting your email address and choose alerts for the PTO to send you. Uh, you can choose to receive alerts on different topics that range from trademark and copyright alerts to general USPTO press releases and non-trademark focus alerts, uh, more focused on, on the patent side of things. And then finally, I want to mention these um, these symbols and these descriptions that appear on this slide, the PTO calls these common status descriptors. And the PTO recently started using these symbols and descriptions so that users of the PTO website can easily be able, can easily determine the status of an application or registration. For example, on the left, uh, you see a, a green circle with a little ribbon uh, for the Brinks, Gilson, and Leone uh, logo registration. And this indicates that it's a live registration and it's not undergoing any challenge. Uh, the PTO's use of these symbols and the descriptions is part of an effort to harmonize its practices with the world's five largest trademark offices, which are all starting to use the same symbols. 
Uh, these other offices are the trademark offices in Japan, Korea, the European Union, and China. Next, I want to discuss recent and important changes to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board rules of practice. On January 14, 2017, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board implemented numerous amendments to, the rules, to its rules of practice. Uh, these new rules apply to both active and future opposition and cancellation proceedings before the TTAB. Uh, they're designed to streamline the board proceedings, especially with regard to discovery and pretrial procedures. And it's also, and the new changes are designed to reflect the federal rule of civil procedure standard regarding the concept of proportionality of discovery sought by the parties. Uh, listed on this slide and the next slide are some of what I think are the more significant changes that uh, recently were implemented. For example, uh, a big change is that all pleadings and submissions must be filed electronically. Uh, service of all papers must be made by email unless otherwise stipulated. And related to that is response periods are no longer extended by, by, five, by five days for service by first class mail and priority mail, um, the pa basically paper service. Uh, some more discovery related changes are all discovery requests and responses must be served and all documents must be produced on or before the close of discovery. Uh, so no longer, uh, parties can no longer serve discovery requests on the last day of the discovery period. Uh, requests for admission and requests for production are now limited to 75, which brings it in line to the interrogatories in the board proceedings. Uh, deadlines for submissions to the board that are initiated by a date of service are now 20 days. And another big change is that testimony may now be submitted uh, in board proceedings in the form of an affidavit or declaration. Uh, given that a lot of these changes are take, or a lot of these changes affect discovery procedures and board proceedings, it's important to have a discovery plan in place well before the discovery period starts uh, so the process can be completed quickly and effectively before the discovery period ends. And in addition to these rule changes that are listed on these slides, as noted in the prior slide, the PTO raised the fees for filing a petition to cancel and a notice of opposition from $300 to $400 per class. And there's also a, a brand new fee to file extensions of time to file an opposition. There will be a $100 fee to file a 60-day extension of time after the initial 30-day extension, which is granted free of charge, and then a $200 fee for the last 60-day extension. Now I'd like to highlight two, um, two cases that raise interesting and important trademark questions. The first case is Enray Tam, which started in 2011 when Simon Tam, the frontman for an Asian American dance rock band called The Slants, applied to register the band's name for entertainment services in the nature of live performances by a musical band. Uh, this graphic that you see on the right of the slide here, this is actually the specimen of use that Mr. Tam submitted with his application showing use of the mark, the slants, in connection with these services. Uh, you'll see the slants name is the, the second name on the, the bill there. Uh, the PTO refused registration of the marks, stating that the slants mark consists of or includes matter that may disparage or bring into contempt or disrepute any or persons of Asian descent. And the TTAB affirmed the examining attorney's refusal to register the mark, and Mr. Tam appealed the, the refusal to the Federal Circuit. Now, the basis for the PTO examining attorneys and the TTAB's refusal of, of the slant, the refusal of registration of the slant's mark was Section 2A of the Lanham Act. Uh, which prohibits registration of marks that consist or comprise of immoral, deceptive, or scandalous matter, or matter which may disparage or falsely suggest a connection with persons, institutions, beliefs, or national symbols, or bring them into contempt or disrepute. Uh, the PTO uses a two-part test for determining whether an applied for mark is disparaging. First, they, they examine the mark's likely meaning, as determined by dictionary definitions, and in the manner in which it's used in the marketplace, and whether the meaning may be disparaging to a substantial com composite of the reference group. Uh, in the past, applicants have challenged the provision as violating their free speech, but courts have rejected those claims, and they held that the trademark registration process is not covered by the First Amendment. On appeal and an in bank decision from the Federal Circuit, the, federal, the, the court reversed course and held that Section 2A violates the First Amendment and is thus unconstitutional. Uh, the court held that even though the trademark, trademarks have a commercial component, Section 2A of the Lanham Act regulates an expressive message of the applicant's speech. Specifically, the court stated that 
the law targets viewpoints in the marketplace, and the government provided no compelling reason for the regulation of an appellant, the, the applicant's speech. The court also the court also said that refusal to register a mark that, is, that the government deems to be offensive or disparaging creates a chilling effect on the applicant's speech because denial of the registration creates a disincentive to adopting the mark as it would leave the trademark owner without a registration. The tra without the registration, the trademark owner would lose out on benefits of owning the registration such as nationwide notice and ownership of ownership and evidence, uh, nationwide notice of ownership and evidence of the validity of the mark. Uh, the court also rejected the government's argument that denying registration of offensive marks is government speech, which would lay outside the bounds of the First Amendment. The court held that the government registered that when, a re when the government registers a mark, it is only conveying a message that the mark is registered, and not a substantive message. Um, and the Supreme Court, as I, this is the case where the Supreme Court heard oral arguments just last week on January 18th. And while the case is pending and until the Supreme Court rules, the PTO suspended all applications currently facing a Section 2A rejection. Uh, the next case that I'd like to discuss raises an interesting question which could have implications for both owners of U.S. trademarks and owners of foreign trademarks. Um, in Belmora v. Bear, the issue is, does the Lanham Act allow a foreign business that has neither used nor registered the mark in the United States to sue the owner of a United States trademark for conduct relating to the use of the mark? Uh, the background in this case is that Belmora sells over-the-counter pain relief products under the Flannex mark, and they also own a registration for the mark. Uh, Bear owns, or sells a similar product in Mexico, also under the Flannex mark, and owns a Mexican registration for the mark. And it's important to note that Bayer has never sold or marketed the Flannex product, its Flannex product, in the United States. Uh, this slide shows the picture of Bayer's Flannex product uh, sold in Mexico on the left, and then Balmora's Flannex product sold in the United States on the right. As you can see, they're, they're very similar in appearance. Now, this case started when Bayer petitioned to cancel Balmora's U.S. registration and the, the TTAB ended up canceling the registration. And the important part of the TTAB's ruling is that they found that Bayer has standing to bring the cancellation to action because it lost its ability to control its reputation and thus suffered damage. <coughs> they also found that Belmora had made blatant misuse of the Flannex mark in the U.S. in a manner calculated to trade on the reputation and goodwill of, of Bayer's Mexican Flannex mark. Uh, as it said, the TTAB granted Bayer's petition to cancel and Belmore appealed the decision to the U.S. District Court for the District of Virginia. And then Bayer also brought uh, false advertising claims and a claim for false designation in the District Court. Uh, the Eastern District of Virginia reversed the TTAB's decision and dismissed Bayer's claims of false designation of origin and, and advertising. false advertising. The court held that Bayer lacked standing because it did, had not used its flannex mark in U.S. Commerce and its claims did not meet the zones of interest test set forth by the Supreme Court in Lexmark uh, v. Static Control. Specifically, the court found that Bayer's alleged rights and harm did not fall within the scope of the Lanham Act's protection of U.S. trademark rights. Bayer appealed to the Fourth Circuit, and the Fourth Circuit vacated the district court's decision and remanded for further proceedings. They found that standing under the Lanham Act does not require use or registration of mark in the U.S., but rather requires only a reasonable basis to conclude that defendant's activities in the U.S. will damage the clam claimant and Bayer's allegations would result, in the, would result in loss of customers and revenue, and those were sufficient to meet the Lanham Act zone of interest. Uh, Bel Belmore has filed a cert petition, and it's also important to note that this, the specific question at issue in this case is about standing and whether Bayer's claims will survive a motion to dismiss remains to be seen whether Bayer would ultimately prevail on its claims. It would be interesting to see how this plays out. And now I turn it over to Greg, who will talk about key claim construction rules. Thank you, and welcome for, uh, uh, for joining us. We're, I'm going to talk to you about some claim construction decisions that have occurred in 2006 or slightly earlier, and the way the presentation is set out is intended to provide really a survey of different um, situations in which claim construction issues have come up, uh, not to focus on one particular case, and citations are there if you uh, are interested in looking into any cases in more depth. Uh, I'll start off with a few general construction principles, no real uh, groundbreaking decisions here. 
Uh, the construction that gives all terms meaning is a, a preferred over one that does not. Construction that renders some of the terms superfluous is generally disfavored. And a construction that results in inoperability, inoperability even as it relates to uh, one of the embodiments is typically viewed with skepticism. How about the timing of claim construction, which can be important? Um, the first two cases are examples in which um, the substantive motions at issue were considered to be premature in light of the uh, status of claim construction. The first uh, could be important to those uh, who might be seeking invalidity based on a 101 challenge. And in this case, uh, that came early. It was in the case of a uh, motion to dismiss. And the court said that that was too early because it needed to obtain a so-called full understanding of the basic character of the claim subject matter. Second case, uh, different posture. This was in the context of summary judgment. And for, for those folks who want to seek summary judgment early in the process, uh, they ran into a problem here. Even though the same patent had been construed in another case, the court said that the, the motion was premature that they needed a more formal claim construction. Uh, the next case has to do with a uh, proceeding before the PTAB in which uh, the proposition of a new claim construction was considered to be too late because it was raised in a rehearing in the first instance. And because the basis for a rehearing is that the uh, something was either overlooked or misapprehended, the and the claim construction was never raised before, that, that couldn't meet the standard. And the last one has to do with a challenge to a claim construction in the posture, posture of a jury instruction, which, again, was considered to be uh, too late. A couple cases on the plain meaning of terms. Um, the instructing the jury that they should just assume the plain meaning when there's actually a bona fide dispute between the parties is a violation of the so-called O2 micro decision, which in simply put means that if there is a dispute, it must be resolved by the court. The trustees of Columbia case involved a situation where uh, a party asserted a position whereby the claim term should be viewed as they would be in the relevant community and changed only if expressly redefined or Disavowed. The Federal Circuit hold that, held that that's a violation of the Phillips standard. It's, that's more consistent with the prior precedent under Texas Digital and uh, wasn't, wasn't the proper approach. Uh, here's, here's an interesting case on using the specification as a claim construction tool. One reason it was interesting is because the term in dispute was actually the word is, I asked. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a great example of when the specification is actually considered to be of very limited value, which is when the claim terms on their face are readily understood, that there's very um, little reason to look to the specification. So that, that was a case that stood out. A couple cases on using the preamble as a limitation. Again, I think this is fairly well-established law, and, and one cute trick to get a preamble incorporated into the complaint, into the body of the claim, is to provide uh, antecedent basis in the preamble so that when you refer back, the preamble looks more like a limitation in the body of the claim. Um, the case I've, uh, cases I've given here where uh, the preamble was not considered a limitation were situations in which it was simply stating a purpose or intended use for the invention, and the body of the claim itself was considered complete. The, the two cases for means plus functions that I've, uh, I've, been, I've included here are both computer implemented functions in which the courts did impose 112 paragraph 6 in connection with the uh, two claim terms at issue and, and subsequently went looking in the spec to find the required corresponding algorithm, failed to, to find it, and the claims were considered uh, invalid for indefinite. Introducing negative limitations in the claim can be done under a couple circumstances. One is where you have alternative features described, and once they're described, you can in turn disclaim them. And the second case, the LifeNet case, presents an interesting situation where a, a, a negative functional limitation was actually considered to be a positive structural element. <clears throat> Here the term non-removal limitation was viewed to be another way of saying that a particular plasticizer could be present and um, was, was viewed as a, a claim limitation. 
I have a case here about Marcouche groups. It's, it's really a case about claim differentiation. Essentially says that if you use the term consisting of to present Marcouche language, that a dependent claim that refers back cannot uh, broaden that group beyond what's expressly set forth. Um, similarly, these next couple of cases stand for the same proposition, but sort of in a different way. Where claim differentiation, which of course is viewed as a as a guide, not a rule, uh, was rejected, was where the um, party attempted to invoke it by comparing two independent claims. And the court said, no, that, that doesn't shed light on the scope of, of the claim at issue. And neither do, do comparisons of claims that appear in different patents. On the other hand, in a more traditional sense, in the sight sound case, the Federal Circuit said it was appropriate to use claim differentiation in a dependent and independent claim situation where the claims were close but had distinct language in the dependent claim. Uh, using the file history uh, in claim construction is, is typically done, but what's not typically done is reading limitations and importing them from the file history into the claims themselves, and that's what happened in the Indicon case. Um, the applicant repeatedly <coughs> indicated that in every instance a specific word was associated with a specific file, and so the court, in this case, properly read that limitation into the claim. Um, the bottom case of Warsaw Orthopedic is an example of a uh, accused infringer, infringer over-reading the breadth of an amendment. Uh, the prosecution history indicated that so-called stopping step was added to overcome prior art, but it didn't refer to all stopping. And so the defendant who attempted to rely on that, that defense was the subject of uh, a potential inducement claim because their defenses were not, uh, were not legitimate. Uh, just real quick, a couple cases on the, some transitional cases. The server tech case involved a situation that, that teaches that uh, when a terpet, terpet, uh, power strip that was interpreted to be one piece uh, was improper when the claim read uh, reporting system associated with an enclosure. And so the elements in a per comprising claim can transcend two separate um, components. The consisting essentially of case I have here just stands for the proposition that if, if a question arises as to what the basic and novel properties are in a claim involving that transitional phrase, the court has to construe what that is. And in the Beckman case, a where-in clause essentially served as a claim limitation like no other, to add, like any other, to add a uh, step in, in, in making a two-step claim, two claim into a three-step claim. And the, the board uh, sort of missed the boat on that, and the Federal Circuit turned them around, saying the wearing clause can, can obviously add an additional step in a method claim. Uh, a couple good examples of when it's appropriate to use dictionaries as a claim construction tool. Dictionaries can be used where the plain and ordinary meaning is in dispute. The dictionary uh, definitions can be used where the intrinsic evidence is silent as to the plain, ordinary meaning. But of course, uh, as I think was well settled law, inappropriate to use extrinsic evidence like a dictionary when it conflicts with the intrinsic evidence. Uh, I'm going to handle this quickly just because expert testimony regarding claim construction tends to be very um, situational and judge specific. There's a couple cases here where the court denied the use of expert testimony to support claim construction arguments and a few where, where it was permitted. So that uh, those situations can go either way. Uh, but expert testimony cannot be used to um, when they're in conflict with the Markman construction. Uh, it's, it's possible, of course, to disclaim um, subject matter during prosecution. Um, one danger is using the expression present invention and talking about what it is. Um, this happens sometimes in, for example, the summary of the invention. And in this particular case, the court found that there was a clear disavowal by, the, by defining what the in present invention was. Uh, the next two bullets really speak to an issue where the applicant, either in the prosecution history or in the application itself, makes some sort of disparaging or distinguishing remarks about the prior art. That's a pretty good indicator that the claim should not encompass that element. Let's talk a little bit about the um, standard for claim construction in the PTAB. 
course, the Supreme Court has uh, laid to rest the question as to whether or not the PTAB can use a different standard than the district courts and use broadest reasonable interpretation, and the answer to that question is yes. Uh, the trivascular case, however, tells us that it, the broadest reasonable interpretation has some limits, that it, it, it must be read consistent with the specification, and the board does not have unfettered license to read a term as, as broadly as it, as it chooses. Um, can the PTA be ever used, Phillips says, a, as a guiding claim construction principle? Yes, it can, in limited circumstances. If a patent is expired, it's appropriate to use the Phillips standard. Uh, if it expires during the, uh, during the course of the post-grant review, also appropriate to apply Phillips. There is a new CFR provision, 42100, that the Patent Office added to uh, indicate that a party may request claim construction under Phillips if it certifies that the patent will expire within 18 months. And the PBC broadband case really just stands for the proposition that um, the Federal Circuit understands that um, the board uses different claim construction principles in an IPR and that it was appropriate to do so in that case. Uh, this is an interesting nuance to PTAB procedure, which is that because it is a uh, artifact of the Administrative Procedure Act, there is a substantial notice requirement. And so the Dell case shows us that uh, in a situation where the PTA invalidated a claim on a construction that was introduced for the first time um, at oral argument, that that failed to give the patent owner sufficient notice and therefore um, could not be uh, relied upon. And similarly, in the SAS case, the PTAB invalidated claims using a new construction that was seen for the first time in its final written decision, also failed to give notice under the APA. Here's, here's a couple examples of when uh, claim construction assertions are too late. The Wyland Apple case tells us that uh, it's absolutely too late to try to invoke a new claim construction on a judgment as a matter of law, which comes by definition after trial. Here's a slide meant to demonstrate the fact that notwithstanding the fact that parties might stipulate to a claim construction, it has no uh, preclusive effect on a subsequent court, uh, either through issue preclusion or judicial estoppel, the reason being that a stipulation is, does not satisfy the requirement that it actually be litigated and be litigated substantially, so there's no preclusive effect, even though it seems somewhat uh, inequitable, I guess, depending upon which side you're standing on. Um, how about the effect of district court markman proceedings on PTAB proceedings? Well, uh, the PTAB is not permitted to simply ignore claim constructions, even if they occur under Phillips and not under the broadest um, interpretation. According to the Federal Circuit, the PTAB should acknowledge and assess the uh, claim construction that the district court or Federal Circuit uh, followed to make sure that um, it's not relevant and to see whether or not it's consistent with the broadest reasonable construction. How about the other direction? Does a PTAB construction have any effect on the district court? Uh, by, by and large, the answer is no. Um, the first Adidas case shows us that uh, a court is not going to take a preliminary construction from the PTAB as, as being um, relevant in the denial of an IPR request. And um, the microwave decision just simply shows us that uh, the federal uh, the district court was allowed to disagree with the with the board because it follows a, a different standard. Last couple of slides. The first is uh, when can you get into trouble on claim construction? Well, um, not following it or adopting positions that are frivolous. Um, the Seeking case involved a, a situation where the court said that they might as well have argued that the sky is the ground. That's how far afield they've got from the claim construction, and that was worthy of fees. Uh, on the other hand, a couple cases where uh, fees were not appropriate, situation where a party imported limitations from the spec into the claims and their claim construction, and based on their position, the court said that's too fine of a line to draw in awarding fees, at least in this particular case. And uh, the SAP case involved a situation where, notwithstanding the fact that all the claims were invalidated on re-exam, that it was because it was a hard-fought battle, simply uh, winning in a case doesn't necessarily win fees, and 
So the American rule, uh, as it's known, is, was followed in that case. L last slide, um, appeal and interlocutory review. Obviously, claim constructions must be preserved. This is a case in the PTAB where um, no position was taken in connection with the term process, and it was considered to be waived. The Skyhawk case is interesting in as much as it shows us that if you win before the PTAB, you have no standing to appeal that decision. Uh, if you're wondering why anyone ever would, it's because they, they didn't care for the overly narrow construction that they got before the PTAB and were concerned about the subsequent district court proceeding. Um, nevertheless, the Federal Circuit said you can't appeal it, but you can, of course, take that issue before the district court and make your arguments there. And finally, um, the last case simply stands for the accepted premise that claim constructions are ordinarily not uh, proper for interlocutory appeal, which is the old Nystrom versus Trex case. So with that, I will give you the CLE code three of three, which is Centennial. Okay, thank you, Greg. This is Jim Sobroy again. Uh, we have time for a few questions, and we did receive a few questions during the course of the presentation. Let me take them in the order in which they were received. First, someone asked a question, what's the difference between an affidavit and a declaration? Uh, let me answer the question this way. They're, they're both forms of uh, sworn testimony that are, are in a written form. Uh, the affidavit would be a series of statements. My name is, for example, James Soberay, and I attest that these facts are true. And then after I sign that document, the document is signed in front of a notary public who also countersigns the document and then affixes his or her seal that attests that the, the statements were made under oath. Uh, a declaration has the same effect as, as an affidavit um, in certain forms, like, like the district courts. And basically, the, the statements, you make the same factual statements, but they don't have to be made in front of a notary. Instead, at the end of the declaration, you have your name, the date, and a statement that you understand these statements are made under penalty of perjury. So in either case, if you make a false statement, you're subject to a risk of being prosecuted for perjury. Therefore, you want to make sure the statements are true. Uh, the next question we have is, will the PowerPoint presentation, PowerPoint slides be emailed? And the answer is yes, we plan to do that over the next few days. Uh, I see that we're, we're, we're out of time. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to email them. Uh, to, to us, um, all the speakers' uh, names and photographs and information is, is on our website, and you can obtain their email addresses there as well. So feel free to reach out them, to them directly. Also, let me give a plug for our next webinar. It's, uh, it will be entitled The Realm of Chemicals, Nanotechnology, and Key Cases for 2017. That will take place on February 1st at noon Central Time. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us, and I wish you a good day. That does conclude today's program. You may disconnect at any time. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.